For those of you who are starting with this video, my name is Claire Webb and I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. I'm a senior at Bennington College studying restorative justice. In this video, I will be talking about the essential structure of circles and going over the basics of circle facilitation. So I want to begin by saying that everything I will suggest in this video is optional. Every circle is different. Topic and size and length and audience and the type of the circle all contribute to the ways in which facilitation can be adapted. Feel free to reach out with any questions you might have about changing circles to meet your specific needs. So to begin a circle, introduce yourself, then introduce the circle. Why are you here? What's the topic? Uh, introduce the talking piece. Why is it significant to you? Why did you choose it? Um, what is its purpose? Mention picking up the pass, which means that the talking piece will go around the circle multiple times so that during the first round or even the second round, um, if people don't want to speak or if they're not ready to speak, they can pass and it'll come back to them. Um, it's a good way of letting people know that they don't have to pressure themselves to speak on the first try. Um, then introduce the centerpiece. Um, ideally, there's going to be something alive in the center of the circle, such as flowers and pine cones, house plants, etc., because this sort of grounds people um, in nature and also in the space. But also, don't be afraid to just choose things for the centerpiece that look pretty. Um, having something visually appealing for participants to focus on while they're speaking is a really good idea. It's really hard to maintain eye contact or to know who to look at during a circle, so this is a good way to sort of avoid some of that internal conflict. Next, go over guidelines. And what I suggest is asking for guidelines rather than proposing your own. Um, it's okay to provide some examples, like respect or making space for vulnerability. After you've given participants the chance to propose guidelines, ask if anyone would like to change or express concerns about any of the guidelines that were proposed, including ones that you yourself may have proposed. Um, this is also a good opportunity to talk about the idea of listening to understand. Recommending that participants practice active listening rather than thinking about what they plan to say next is a good way to keep a circle attentive and to help participants feel heard. Now there's a time to acknowledge the history your work is based on. This may include land acknowledgements, acknowledgements of indigenous tradition regarding circles and talking pieces, um, and acknowledgements of the rise of circle processes to more widespread consciousness through Quaker and Mennonite use. The opening ceremony is the true start to the circle. This is an opportunity for your creativity to shine. As a facilitator, it is up to you to set the tone for the circle. Personally, I like to ask participants to close their eyes um, and get in touch with their bodies for a moment. So after you complete whatever opening ceremony you choose, um, you can ask questions that are related to the circle. So introductions are often merged with an icebreaker. For example, tell us your name and a story connected with your name is a common one. But try to connect icebreakers in some way, however vaguely, to the topic of the circle. The most difficult thing about teaching circle facilitation, or even making a brief video explaining it, um, is that circles are so adaptable. Um, so the body of a circle, it's really hard to give advice on what to do, because you can do anything. I mean, it depends on the topic of the circle. It depends on what kind of circle it is. There are three tiers of circles. The bottom tier of a circle is community building, um, which are the majority of circles. Uh, they're just circles to sort of allow people to connect with each other more deeply. Um, and these circles often have topics like communication, healthy intimacy. These are some examples of circles I've facilitated. Um, I facilitated a circle on gender and resources for gender identity. But the one thing I will suggest is that you play into your specific skill set. If you're an artist, have your participants do art. Um, if you're a writer, have them write. And if you have things in your home that make for good activities, bring them. Like bring whatever you're passionate about into the circle and it'll rub off on your participants. So as far as closing ceremonies, uh, I personally like to close circles by having every participant write down something that they're bringing away from the circle on a note card and then adding it to the centerpiece. Um, this is partially a nice exercise for people to reflect and partially a way for me to conduct research without breaking um, like confidentiality. So after you thank the participants for coming, give them an opportunity for further connection. Um, standing around and chatting about anything left unsaid is great, uh, but not always possible due to time constraints. Uh, so provide a sign-up sheet, uh, email addresses that people can use to get in touch with each other, um, or at least a handout with your contact information. 
The next video I'll be focusing a little more on the diversity, equity, and inclusion aspect of circles, but I wanted to touch on just a few of the key aspects which facilitate equality. Um, the first of these is speaking time. Circles allow participants equal chance to speak without the danger of one person interrupting and monopolizing conversation. The only risk, other than participants flat out ignoring guidelines, which is a risk, um, is that certain participants might take more time during their turn to speak than others. So I'm going to address some ways of dealing with this in the next video. The very structure of a circle attempts to level the playing field for participants. Everyone is arranged in a circle so that despite the presence of a facilitator, there's no head of the circle. The idyllic version of a circle is based on no one being in charge per se, rather a collection of people helping out with different areas. In the platonic ideal of a circle, everyone is equal. The activities and the questions that occur during a circle are flexible and adaptable. They can be taken from suggested exercises and changed to be more inclusive, or they can be directly related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um. What I really love about restorative justice is that at its core, it's a collaborative process. What it really comes down to is communication. So in cases of diversity and inclusion, it gives someone who has experienced marginalization the opportunity to articulate their experience. And that gives them agency over that experience. It's incredibly empowering. And it's also super healing um, to voice what happened to you to a group of people and to someone that did something to you allows you um, to be at peace and also um, allows them to grow from that and there's so much collaboration like I said that happens within that um, and because of that more so than other resolution practices you're really able to move forward as an individual who has experienced harm and as a community that is attempting to grow from that and improve.